Welcome to the Blue Waters webinar series. I'm Scott Lathrop with the Blue Waters Project at the National Center for our Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. It's our pleasure to uh, welcome Aaron Saxton to uh, have a follow-on session to his previous session on machine learning. Today he'll be talking about machine learning on Blue Waters using TensorFlow with the image feature detection problem. And Aaron's a, a data scientist in the Blue Waters Project. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Aaron. Thank you for joining us again today. Uh, great, thank you, Scott. Um, so let's see, uh, a couple months ago, we did, uh, I, I did this presentation where um, I tried to explain this uh, problem and we got through a lot of the background. So we talked about uh, neural networks and, and uh, convolutions and backpropagation and kind of all these building blocks that went into it. Unfortunately, I ran out of time when I actually wanted to show you how to do this kind of stuff on Blue Waters. Um, so today we're going to uh, do a little bit of a review um, from what we talked about last time, but most of it's going to be uh, some Blue Water specific, uh, a lot of Blue Water specific uh, uh, details about this process. So topics today, um, if you haven't, uh, hop onto Blue Waters and CSA Illinois, webinars, data analytics, ML TensorFlow, um, and you can find a link to the previous uh, uh, the, the, the previous webinar uh, that goes through all the de details I just m mentioned. Um, I'm going to do another review of Blue Waters. Uh, Blue Waters is very very unique, especially when you start if you uh, went. If you go and listen to some of these other webinars on machine learning, uh, their architectures are usually very, very different than ours. Um, uh, ours is about five years old. It was built under a set of uh, different assumptions, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but these are details that uh, we, we have to pay attention to what, when, we're, when we're building up our, our code to run a distributed TensorFlow. So I'm going to belabor that point a little bit, even if it's a review for the audience. Um, then a little bit of a neural network review. Uh, just to uh, get our brains going about that. Again, um, some TensorFlow basics, wh uh, what it is and, and, and all that. Uh, then distributed TensorFlow. Really, this, is going, uh, this talk is going to be the specific features of uh, distributed uh, TensorFlow on Blue Waters. Um, some parallelization schemes. Uh, there's some choices you can make. I'm going to go through the most vanilla uh, uh, way, but I want to uh, point out that, oh, you know, whenever you're working on your project, you could indeed uh, uh, do something fancy. Um, and then code tw uh, tour and demos. Uh, I'll be going through some of the work that I'm, I'm uh, giving out to the community so that they can look at that for an example and uh, build their project off of. And then uh, demos. I, uh, I'm going to try and, uh, the demo gods are with us today. I'm going to try and uh, build a little simple uh, linear uh, regression that will run on uh, on Blue Waters. So those are today's topics. Um, Blue Waters, a uh, massively parallel uh, 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 computing system. Um, one of the advantages is it has uh, roughly 26 usable petabytes of storage. Um, these are on a Lustre file system, uh, so uh, where you can stripe your files. Uh, and it, you know, dis uh, and it's all distributed across many, uh, many, many, many uh, uh, of these Synexian boxes. Um, this is a little bit of an underrated feature uh, from my uh, my perspective. Uh, this is one of the reasons that we want to try and do more data science uh, with systems like Blue Waters. Is there's just this massive uh, storage backend. Um, so, oh, here we go. Here's my cursor. So uh, we have our massive storage uh, massive storage backend. Um, Blue Waters is just racks and racks and racks of blades. Now these blades come in two varieties. They come in an XE variety and an XK variety. These uh, blades have four sockets on each one. On the XE variety, that means that there, uh, there are four discrete uh, uh, ADM processors on them. So on the XE nodes, we can uh, place uh, four distinct uh, 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 no, uh, uh, or we, we can uh, place many, many uh, uh, processing elements across all those four. On, X, on XKs, there are only two uh, distinct uh, ADM processors with NVIDIA GPUs attached to them. 
Um, so this is important because most of the things, uh, most of the webinars and, and uh, blogs you read right now, um, the most modern uh, architecture configuration is you wind up attaching many, many, many of the of the uh, NVIDIA or the graphics cards to a single or uh, a shared uh, uh, CPU bus. Um, on Blue Waters, it uh, you get one GPU per one node that you, that you uh, allocate for yourself. But uh, one thing Blue one thing Blue Waters does have is four thousand, getting close to five thousand somewhere between 4,000 and 5,000 uh, GPUs on there. So even if it's, it doesn't, it's not necessarily one of the more modern uh, architectures of multiple GPUs per CPU, um, it, you still have a huge number of GPUs uh, to take advantage of. And so that's, that's kind of the point. And those are made available through our XE nodes. Um, okay. So uh, another refresher, reminder, uh, that, um, the big thing where I, I want to point you to, uh, uh, something you can run on Blue Waters, is the image feature detection uh, uh, problem uh, running on the ImageNet data. Uh, go review the last uh, uh, webinar I gave, and I talk a lot more about this. Um, so some highlights of it is uh, it's a very high quality data set, uh, roughly 14 million uh, images, 21,000 uh, different classifications, all annotated, all uh, well annotated, uh, and whatnot. Uh, the machine learning technique, uh, the per, uh, the, one of the big pieces of the machine learning technique uh, that, we, um, that the image feature detection problem uses is neural networks, uh, in particular convolutional neural networks, but uh, starting with the more basics of neural networks, uh, they're basically uh, fancy regressions with a with a uh, with a, a sort of a complicated function that you're trying to fit to the data. Um, so on the left is is more of the uh, the algebra portion of this. So your function notation about okay, uh, and then on the right is uh, more of your your uh, uh, diagram description. So you have a layer of inputs. These inputs could be pixels in your in your image. Um, and so, and then on your algebra, that's being represented as your X input here. Uh, when we say that these inputs get mapped to a hidden la layer, that is just a composition inside this uh, uh, sigma function. And I'll explain more about what this is. Uh, it's an indicator function. If you put in certain values of X, it may return a low value. Other values of X, it'll return a high value. And so when I say that, oh, a certain input will light up certain neurons in here, that means that the sigma function is returning a, high, a higher value. So the hidden layer is the result of, uh, of whatever this, uh, this, uh, this, activation, uh, the, this activation function uh, is outputting. And then the, the actual output layer, the thing that tells us what our classification is or maybe what the... Uh, what the corners of our bounding box are um, is, is yet another aggregation of the results of the, of the hidden layer. And so, once again, this is just a little bit of, of algebra about what your input is, do whatever calculation the, uh, the, sig uh, the sigma function tells you to do, and then go uh, combine all, the, all this, go weight, combine this uh, with weights, and uh, there's also something called uh, your, your, your uh, logits and softmaxes, which is what this G is. We're not going to, we went into that last time. We're not going to get into that today. And that produces, oh, a high likelihood that uh, whatever your input data uh, is an indicator for a particular feature, that the, your image is a dog or a cat, depending on which one, uh, one of these outputs get lit up. Um, but the reason I wanted to put this in your head again is Whenever we're trying to build these, these networks, the first thing is to say, all right, let's architect the way that all our input, input, hidden, and output layers are. But the thing we're training is what these weights are, what this, these betas and alphas. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. What these betas and alphas, these are the trainable unknown parameters that once you feed a whole bunch of data through and backward uh, through these things, uh, this, this, is, uh, this is the thing we're trying to find. 
Um, so the sigma functions are these uh, these activation functions uh, that have a tendency of uh, having a very uh, an asymptotic low value as you have very negative uh, inputs and an asymptotic high value as you have uh, very positive inputs. Um, it turns out that the modern thing that most neural networks use are called these rectifiers, or rec rectified linear unit. Um, it turns out that uh, the uh, logistic and the arctan is, you know, theoretically what you go uh, develop neural networks for, but practically uh, the computation is simply uh, faster and easier to do uh, when we replace them with a, a rectified linear, linear unit. And then a reminder what our softmax was. Uh, weighted sum. All right, uh, some, let's see, uh, some tensor uh, flow uh, basics, uh, reminders. Uh, TensorFlow has a Python API, but underneath the hood, it's all C++. This means uh, when you actually do your session.run, it's taking, taking advantage of threading and, uh, and CUDA and, and all that kind of thing uh, when it's actually doing the, 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 temper, uh, the tensor operations. Um, it used to <clears throat> brag that it was some of the fa fastest on the market. Uh, I've seen some uh, papers out there that are claiming uh, TensorFlow and even Cafe, uh, Cafe 2 are creeping up on it, uh, if, have, if not have exceeded, uh, overtaken it. So right now the whole industry is kind of uh, uh, battling for that per performance edge. Um, but TensorFlow has legacy, um, so we're gonna talk about that today. Um, the, uh, the, the programming model is, uh, is a, a mediator design pattern. Um, that means that you go uh, basically set up uh, the the outline of your of your computations, what tensor uh, tensors you want to actually uh, compute from uh, which variable input data, um, and then you hand it off to uh, TensorFlow session with uh, through its uh, with a context manager, and it goes and figures out what literally is going to 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 get performed on your architecture. Um, this uh, has promise that it allows. The developers of TensorFlow to do automatic optimization for you. Um, sometimes it does it well, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so we're, uh, today we'll try and tease out some of the, the reasons that it, it can figure these things out for you and sometimes it can't. Um, so right, the workflow is construct your operations. Uh, d uh, you, you can give it some uh, context that uh, help you either label uh, the sections of your code correctly or t uh, tell it explicitly to go do a computation on a particular device and then once you construct your, your program flow you actually say all right go tensorflow do your thing um, tensorflow uh, has huge amounts of uh, 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 guides and documentation uh, mostly um, in particular this low level intro uh, we, we did a little bit of that last time um, is a good a good place to start. Uh, we'll we'll blow through this uh, a little bit later. Okay, so up to this point, um, that was a review. That was to tickle your brains and be like, oh yeah, we did kind of talk about something like that last time. Uh, so the distributed uh, <coughs> uh, so distributed TensorFlow. Um, uses this parameter server uh, workers uh, execution model. Um, there are good things about it and bad things about it. Uh, uh, the, one of the good things is that, uh, or so, so a little more description. Um, whenever, you cr uh, whenever you create variables for your model, um, in, in particular, if you were to say, give me, give me, a, uh, give me a neural network, um, inside of inside of that uh, neural network object, uh, TensorFlow is constructing uh, some of the variables for it, some of the trainable variables. Uh, they get uh, they get assigned to a, a parameter server. Um, so the parameter server actually contains the things that we're training, um, and it it it's there to sort of coordinate. All right, what was the the most recent thing to happen to uh, to these variables, and and what you know how do how do I continue to evolve them and, and update them. Um, but then the work, uh, on, the, on the worker side of it, it's constantly asking parameter server, oh, hey, what's the latest thing that I can use? 
and it grabs the, the latest state of, of your trainable uh, parameters and then runs the actual training algorithm uh, with whatever batch of data it grabs. So the reason that uh, this was a desirable uh, model in the early days is it turns out that this is uh, resilient. You can set up your parameter servers to uh, have redundant copies of your parameters um, or to spread them out all over the place. So balancing, oh, if while you're training a model for several days straight, if your system has a failure for one reason or another, uh, it, it can still recover. So that was the, uh, that was the motivation uh, for TensorFlow to set up this parameter server worker execution model is resiliency. Um, there are others out there, uh, ones that support MPI more natively, uh, especially on a uh, system like Blue Waters where uh, node failure is rare um, and we can train models faster. We don't have to wait uh, days and days and days on, a, uh, on end. Um, this is less important. But this is the, uh, this is the if, if you want to use TensorFlow on Blue Waters, this is the thing we have to wrestle with at the moment. Uh, the team is working on other execution models that, uh, to get those to you. Okay, so with parameter servers and these parameter servers and workers in mind, uh, now let's think about all right, uh, parallelizing this thing. Uh, basically, uh, you have input data um, and your actual algorithm. Uh, there are different ways that you can chop up your input data, and there are uh, different ways that you can chop up your algorithm. Um, our algorithm is uh, 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 chopped up into three big components. The actual model, the inference, the actual model inference, if you push some uh, input data into it, what, uh, what outputs actually get uh, lit up. Um, the loss, after you do uh, uh, a uh, forward and backward pop propagation, um, what, uh, how close are you to, to what the ideal model should actually be? Uh, uh, how close are your weights to what the ideal situation should actually be, or uh, your, your outputs are to what they actually should be. And then the, uh, the optimize. Um, once you know what your, your loss is and you've computed uh, all your, um, all your uh, back propagation coefficients, uh, how do you wiggle those weights, how do you wiggle those trainable parameters in a direction that makes your model a little bit better? So the algorithm is basically a cycle of these, these three pieces. So taking off chunks of your, of your input data. So lists of images and annotations, uh, we pre-process those to package them together. So it's one big list. And how we take uh, chunks of those and then feed them into this, into this cycle. Um, we went into more details last time, so I'm not going to go into it too much this time. But uh, this uh, here, here's some uh, here's a graphical representation of our model, of the inference, and of our data. So Inception uh, version three, it was one of the first uh, <clears throat> models to be this deep. So I, I wanted to point this out to you because these models can get ginormous. Um, so parallelizing, uh, so th there are some choices to the way uh, people may want to parallelize these models as they get bigger in the future. Um, you can imagine maybe we say, oh, the, uh, the, the inference, uh, we, we grab the first half of the inference, oh, okay, so let me back up a little bit. So what, is this, uh, what does this representation actually tell us? Um, so on the left is where the input is. And on the right is where the output is. That little red soft max there is, is going to be what the actual classification is. So on the, on the left, uh, we go and we take an image and we feed it in here. Uh, and we perform, perform a convolution on it. Uh, last time I showed you what image kernels were and, and how you have these uh, strides and, and, and windows and, and all that, and you do some image processing. Uh, you do some image processing, and there's a lot of steps of image processing that uh, the architects of uh, Inception ver uh, version 3 decided were, were important. Um, what's more is uh, there's this other complicated block. 
if you want to know about it, uh, there's a very nice paper about why they thought that this was a good way of doing things. So images get fed in here, convolution on it, it spits out a whole bunch of, uh, 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 spits out, a, or the, there's a whole bunch of uh, stencils, whoops, or, or kernels already uh, chosen in, initially. Uh, you apply those to your images, and then you you uh, you pass it down each one of these layers through here. Finally, it gets split up, gets a soft max, or whoops, this one was, oh, it gets concatenated. So it gets concatenated here, and then split up, convolved again, so each one of these has a big old uh, uh, collection of, of of kernels that uh, that we will indeed be training, and then soft or uh, concatenating again, and so forth. So there's a lot of computation here. Um, the way we're going to parallelize it is we're going to say all of this model sits on a single worker. But I do kind of want to point out that there's there's room to say maybe we want to chop this in half here, maybe we want to chop it many times, and say all right have one worker do this part and then feed the output to the next and then feed the output to the next worker and so forth. Uh, these are all things that uh, if you wanted to do some research on this, uh, by all means. Um, so there are choices with the way we, we could parallelize this. Um, the actual input data though, uh, not so much. Uh, there, there are some things we can choose, but really this is just a big long list of, of images. And so the way we're going to parallelize it is we uh, we shuffle it all up so that so that groups of images that represent the same class aren't together. And then we whoops, ah. and then we split them up into into sets for each of the workers to play with, to to uh, push uh, forward and then back propagate and then optimize the weights. Okay, so a little more uh, detail, uh, details on the parameter server uh, worker side of things. Um, so each of the workers contains a, a, a copy of the inference graph. Each of the workers, oh, uh, I didn't put that in here. So um, and each of the workers gets a, gets a batch of the data. And then it does its, uh, its forward, uh, forward pass, backward pass, computes the loss, and then evolves the weights, uh, the weights of the model. <clears throat> so remember, the weights of this model are tra trainable parameters. There's a, a copy of them sitting on, param on the parameter servers uh, that are there uh, waiting to make them available to work uh, the other workers as each of them uh, goes through this cycle. So model, loss, optimize, report back to the parameter servers, tell them, hey, I, I did my best to update with the, the batch of data I have. Parameter server aggregates that from each of the workers, updates, uh, updates the variables on the parameter servers, so that next time one of the uh, workers comes through, it can, it can grab that set of, uh, of, of variables and then uh, take another uh, batch of the data and pass it through and, and uh, do its cycle again. Um, one thing to notice is that each one of these workers can be doing this cycle at different rates. Um, maybe it got an image that took a little bit of effort to, to uh, decode or to, to perform, perform a convolution on. Um, one of these workers can be doing its cycle over and over and over and over again it's feeding its weights back to the parameter servers and it's, they're getting aggregated and the parameter server is, is, is uh, uh, updating its version of it. But one of the workers is going slow. That's okay. So one of them is uh, being an overachiever, update, uh, feeding more and more data into these. One of them may not be. Once it finishes it, it still aggregates with whatever state of the, uh, of the uh, parameter server is at that time. Uh, that's called async. Uh, that's uh, that's asynchronous training, and out of the box, that's basically what, uh, ten or that is what TensorFlow is doing. Each one of these uh, workers are not necessarily getting synchronized 
as they do this loop over and over and over again. Okay. So now moving on to some uh, uh, Blue Water specific uh, uh, type features. Um, with uh, the latest, greatest uh, 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 hardware architectures, we talked about that uh, you know a single CPU uh, ha on the same bus has many, many GPUs. So if you want to do a multi-GPU uh, run on a system like that, there's there's CUDA and NCCL and all these kinds of things that are already taking care of that for you. Blue Waters, we have to wrestle with uh, uh, with its 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 resource ma uh, management system. So between scheduling a job of the right collection of nodes, so here up on the slide I have an example of allocating a job with, uh, with eight nodes, uh, 16 processes per node on the XK nodes. So this would make 128 discrete processing elements. There's a catch with that. I'll tell you that in a second. Here you can read a little further. So once we uh, tell Blue Waters, indeed, we want you to, for my job to allocate uh, this collection of, of XK nodes, when you actually uh, want to run your executable, run command with arguments, you tell it how many, how many total ways, uh, where's my cursor? You tell it how many total ways of, paral uh, of, of processing elements of parallelism you want. In this example here, I told it eight. And I tell it how many processing elements per node. I tell it exactly one. And the next line is, is telling you why that's important. So what this will do is on each XK node, it puts exactly one process. So on each XK node, it puts one instance of TensorFlow that knows about one single GPU. So this is a little bit of a, a secret sauce about how to get these things to run on Blue Waters. And the reason this is, in, is, is important is if you were to try and take uh, uh, multiple processing elements per node, it would run multiple TensorFlow workers on that node. Um, that node only has one GPU. Uh, they would be competing for it. Uh, in my experiences, they wind up deadlocking. They're not very smart about uh, uh, managing themselves across processes. So one process element per uh, XK node is, uh, is super important for running TensorFlow and Blue Waters, distributed TensorFlow and Blue Waters. And my experience is that the uh, jobs will hang if you uh, don't do this. OK, so the next detail is each Blue Waters uh, node uh, has a host name. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, doing, uh, uh, doing MPI with uh, with TensorFlow is, is not quite an option. Um, we've had some experiments and gotten some things to work, but nothing, not, not, uh, not enough to give out to the community at the moment. Uh, so we basically have to use uh, um, TensorFlow's gRPC over TCP uh, to get this thing to work. So in order to, uh, so once we allocate which nodes we get, we need to go find out what the host names of all the ones that were given to us. In particular, we need to decide which of those host names go to uh, are going to be used for the parameter server and which of the host names are going to be used uh, for the worker. Um, uh, and furthermore, which port uh, that each, uh, the parameter server and worker is going to be uh, executed on or is going to be listening on. Uh, the thing we have uh, installed on Blue Waters to do this is we have this. Uh, you know, we have some, uh, some Python code. Uh, use the socket module to get host name. That will get your uh, local host name, and then use uh, MPI for PY to do an all gather. This will basically give you the host names of uh, of your entire AP run of, of your uh, entire job. So once you get that list, go through and decide. Okay. This particular host name, uh, indeed, I want it part of the, uh, the parameter server. These, I want part of the worker hosts. Um, 
some experiments I've been doing is you can host the parameter server and worker on the same node and, uh, and, give, uh, and give multiple processes per node. Uh, there's a little bit of black magic that goes with that, and uh, um, we're probably not going to get into that today. But uh, they, they, if you were feeling adventurous and wanted to be more clever about how, how exactly how you set up your parameter server and worker uh, distribution across your job, uh, there is plenty of opportunity to fiddle and, uh, and, and, and try and take, uh, take the most advantage of your resources. But today we're going to do it in the most vanilla way. We go allocate a job. Let's say we launch something with uh, three or one parameter server and two workers. Each one of them gets their own host. Each one of them listens on the same uh, port on that host. And this is what's going to tell distributed TensorFlow how to run a distributed TensorFlow cluster uh, uh, on Blue Waters uh, with your jobs allocation. So, uh, <clears throat> distributed TensorFlow has uh, TF train cluster spec and TF train server is the thing that uh, uh, is the thing that tell uh, that, that tells your session um, where uh, who's doing what and where everything is going. And we'll go into examples and demos of this in a second. Okay, so. We went through, we just uh, finished going through several details. One was, the first part was the uh, uh, Q sub and the AP run details of the uh, uh, Blue Water specific resource management. So let me point some of that out here. So uh, here we are on the, uh, on the, an example uh, um, uh, mo or, uh, uh, run script. Uh, so that minus L, the, the number of nodes and processors per node and the type of uh, node to use, that's this line. You can uh, pass it in the command line and overwrite it if you want to do a, a variety of scaling analysis. I happen to do that a lot. Um, and this part of the script is supposed to be as vanilla as possible. You can adjust uh, your, your batch sizes if you wanted. Um, uh, default, I gave you 16. That should, uh, if you wanted to crank it up to 32, 64, it always uh, gives me memory errors. So, 16 was a safe way of doing it. And then down here is our AP run number of nodes. Oh, and I put a two here. So today we might we might get into some of that black magic I was talking about about piling uh, parameter servers and workers together. So that's where that magic happens. But the thing I really want to talk about today is more about the Python code, the actual TensorFlow side of things. Um, so this section here, all through here. So let's see, the host names. We start with our MPI for PY, com world, and then socket get host names. This, uh, so this will give me what, uh, whenever you do that AP run, this, uh, this script is getting run however uh, many times that you did uh, minus uh, little n for. So if we had uh, 10, uh, 10 nodes, this line of code is getting run 10 different times on uh, different locations. So in uh, asynchronously, you're getting 10 different host names here. Then I go ahead and do an all reduce for it. So this winds up being a, uh, a Python list of all the host names. Um, I also ask MPI what my rank is. So if, uh, if I am the third rank, the third item, or the, uh, right, the, uh, the index three of this list is indeed going to be the same as my host name. All right, so a little bit of magic saying, you know what? Yes, yeah, setting up a uh, <clears throat> distributed TensorFlow cluster is a little bit tedious. There's a couple of details that you're like, oh, why can't someone just deal with this for me? But these are basically the three, uh, the two to three lines of code that we use to uh, uh, to gather the data to 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 get through those details. 
Um, so here, let's see. So in this particular scheme, um, the last thing I committed and gave out to the community, what we what I wound up doing <coughs> is uh, each each node had two uh, had two processing elements. That means this hostname list is going to have uh, 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 for for every uh, for uh, uh, each of the uh, instances of this. Um, there's going to uh, they're going to share a host name. Uh, I stuttered through that. I'm not sure if I made that clear. So let's see. In the example, I asked for uh, uh, eight nodes with two processing elements on each node. That means there are 16 different workers going on here. That means this host name list is going to have 16 items, and it's going to be a list where a whole bunch of, there's going to be, uh, be a whole bunch of pairs that have the exact same host name. So what this little uh, set piece of code right here does is it goes and finds, uh, goes and keys it by the host name, and builds a list of all the all the ranks that happen to, uh, or all the processing elements that happen to be on that host name. And because the scheme, the parameter worker scheme I'm trying to do is on the same node, I want to uh, stack a worker and a parameter server. Do a little bit of uh, zip magic, and I take only the first two uh, processing elements on each of those those nodes. And the first uh, first processing element, I decide I'm going to make that my PS rank, and the second processing element, I'm going to make that my worker rank. So I'm not going to belabor this section of code too much more, but the point is, yeah, there's a little bit of code here that, uh, that is uh, the scheme I decided uh, works uh, margin or relatively well about the way we distri uh, distribute uh, uh, parameter servers and workers across the, the nodes that you are given when you, when you allocate your job. In this particular case, I also make as many parameter servers as there are workers, for better or worse. Um, what else do I want to say about this? So this list here, this is the thing. Okay, so this now this section here is some of that black magic that we have to do to make sure that uh, whenever a parameter server and a worker is running on the same node that has a single GPU on it, this uh, piece of black magic here is what causes the parameter server to not try and grab the, uh, the GPU, but then allows the worker to have access to it. Uh, the parameter servers can't, uh, there are pieces uh, of the, the calculations on the parameter server that could uh, take advantage of the GPU. The uh, common sentiment in the community is uh, doing the actual training is, uh, is it's much more valuable to give the GPU to do uh, to the workers than it is the parameter server. So this block of code is that black magic that gets around. Oh, if a parameter server and a worker is on the same uh, same node sharing the same GPU, this this here is what uh, uh, is what allows the parameter server to 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 ignore it and not uh, not lock it up. Cool. <clears throat> so with all that, we get our list of uh, host names and ports, host names and ports uh, for the parameter server and for the worker. And this is, this is the thing we're trying to get at the end of the day. This guy here and this guy here. Feed it into our cluster spec. The input of uh, TensorFlow train, TF train cluster spec is a dictionary whose keys are parameter server and worker, and whose values for those keys are the, the list of host names. This is basically the thing that des uh, describes the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the organization of your cluster. 
So all that work, all that last 20 minutes I, I've been talking has been to be able to construct this object here. So if you got nothing out of all that blah, 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 it's basically to do, to construct this in an, a reasonably smart way. This guy, this object here is what uh, the, the uh, what TensorFlow uses to actually do the communication, to pass the parameters to the, uh, to the uh, uh, parameter server and then back to the workers and back and forth as, as each of the workers finishes with each of its updates. All right, so this part of the code tour, I think I wanna pause here. Let me see what my slides were. Okay, so let's go back and talk over here again. Whoops. All right, so up to this point, um, right, we went through how to actually set up a distributed TensorFlow cluster on uh, in on Blue Waters in your uh, 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 Blue, uh, Blue Waters job. Um, when we're actually running whatever code we want. Uh, the two pieces of magic are, uh, th are the way you assign the devices to do each of the tensor operations is the way you assign the devices to do each of the, uh, each of the operations. And TensorFlow <clears throat> provides uh, this, uh, this uh, method called uh, replica device uh, setter. Basically what this is doing is when you're constructing when you're constructing your graph, so uh, in our case, it's this inception graph. When you're constructing this, this method here, so uh, during the construction of this, we are defining variables, you're defining uh, uh, um, uh, tensor, uh, tensors, and, uh, and TensorFlow is doing its best job to understand what you're telling it, how to link all those together. So as it's stepping through here and doing this, this method is deciding, oh, this little, this little block down here, which parameter server should it go, go to? Which one should be responsible for it? And, uh, and it, it passes to the device which one that particular piece should go to. Um, by, default, <coughs> um, by default, this happens in, round robin, uh, in a, a round robin scheme. So this first little block might get sent to the zeroth parameter server, the second one would go to the first, and so forth, so forth down the line. So all the trainable parameters in this graph somehow gets uh, sprinkled across all your parameter servers. Now there is a local copy too that uh, the local worker will be computing on and updating and then sharing but then when it shares it, it gets, it gets scattered out to all the parameter servers. Parameter server, you write very little code for. So remember this, this little big old block of code here is, uh, this big old block of code here is getting run umpteen number of times, however many uh, uh, processing elements you, you asked for. And then it gets here, and from all the logic and all, all the, uh, the work we just did above here, some of, uh, sometimes it's gonna get here and say, oh, I'm just a parameter server, I don't have to do much. And sometimes it's going to be the worker, and it will continue down through here. Um, I set up some barriers, these com barriers are MPI barriers, uh, just to keep the parameter server alive while the, uh, the workers uh, do their thing. So here's, here's that bit of uh, magic. This is where when you're building, uh, building your TensorFlow graph, you, you need to tell it, uh, well, first you need to tell it um, which graph you're trying to build. In our case, we're just going to use the default. We're not gonna do anything fancy with multiple graphs and passing things between them. Uh, this uh, graph has a local copy, and then it uh, it has whatever weights in it are pinned up in the in the parameter server. So part of it's going to be in parameter server zero, part of it's going to be in parameter zero one, part of it's going to be in however many parameter servers you, you, defi you define. And then this guy here 
is what's telling it, oh, whenever you define a variable, use this particular uh, parameter server to place it on in that round robin fashion. So inside of this block of code is where, um, uh, where we're actually constructing the, the data graph. So I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna save this for a little bit later because I wanna do a simpler example before we get into some of these details. But uh, we, we, uh, we tell it what the actual load uh, operations are uh, in this batch inputs, uh, how to split it up. Uh, somewhere there's the inference. Global step. Optimizer, I thought I, oh, and then the inference down here, the actual logits. And of course I put some uh, name scopes around them so that when we look at our tensor board later, we sort of kind of know where things are. Before, so building the graph, and we're gonna go through more of those details in a simpler example, and then I'm gonna come back and point this out. Now the last ingredient that is uh, distributed TensorFlow specific is this TF train monitor training uh, session. The big thing that gets passed here is remember we had to define, um, <clears throat> we define that server object. And this is where we tell the, uh, tr uh, the session uh, what, the, you know, what the thing is that's actually passing all the variables back and forth. So this is the last piece of uh, specific uh, distributed TensorFlow magic that happens. And it knows about the rest of the server because of the thing we constructed earlier and passing it there. So this session here, whenever we uh, hit dot run, it knows to add the, oh, uh, go, go grab weights and then put your results back uh, because you told it what the server was. Uh, all right, uh, are there any questions? I feel like I'm kind of in a dry portion of this. I hope uh, the audience is getting some, some use out of this. Nope. No okay, cool. Let's see. All right, so up until now, I've been doing kind of, uh, let's see, what time is it? It's uh, 10.50. Um, <clears throat> up until now, I've been doing uh, more of the, 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 the bird's eye view, the 10,000 foot view of the way this process is going, going to go. Uh, we did some review. Um, we did some review of, uh, of neural networks and the data and TensorFlow and Blue Waters. Then I talked about <clears throat> distributed TensorFlow and how it uh, how on Blue Waters you need to go get host names and decide which host names you want to use for your parameter server and which you want to use for your worker. I talked about some black magic that goes on in there that uh, that's we're using specifically for Blue Waters to try and squeeze out some more performance. Um, none of that is set in stone. None of it that is be best practices yet. Um, now at this point, I kind of want to back up a little bit and build an example for you guys. Um, building a full uh, inception example would be difficult, but uh, simple regression is, is consumable. It's something we can do uh, maybe over the next half hour or so. So what we're going to do is we're going to randomly generate some data um, with some known, uh, some known slope and some known uh, uh, y-intercept. It's gonna have some noise in it. And we're going to fit a linear model to that. And we're gonna do this using TensorFlow and we're gonna do it uh, uh, using uh, distributed TensorFlow in, in, in particular. This is you know, you, a little bit using a, a sledgehammer to kill a mosquito, but we can at least see the major, the major features of how to uh, execute one of these. And once we get through that, we'll go and uh, look at some specifics of doing um, uh, the image feature detection problem. Okay, so 
if you're on a, a Blue Waters uh, a login node, presumably you have an allocation and you have all your credentials set up. So here I am. Um, you can either do this uh, through batch scripts um, or whenever I'm prototyping and trying to get something to work, I like going into uh, interactive sessions. Let me, this is another experiment I was working with. So I'm gonna start an interactive job, that's my, or my SL, with 10 nodes. I'm doing 10 nodes because I want, uh, when, we're, when we have the full thing uh, going, I'll want to do uh, uh, two parameter servers and eight workers. I'm doing 16 processors per node during my Q sub because why not, they're available. If I don't use them, they're just gonna to go to waste. And wall time, well, I should, probably should be telling you guys this, but I, uh, I gobble up a big amount of wall time whenever I'm, I'm uh, developing hardcore. So, bam, uh, this might take a while. So, thankfully, I have already started one up. Bam. So you sit there, you wait about five minutes, maybe three if you're lucky, maybe two. And uh, voila, you'll be dumped into an interactive sec session that gives you a, uh, a bash uh, shell prompt on a Blue Waters mom node. At this point, you're sharing this with other users, but from here is where you can run uh, AP run uh, to run whatever executable you build in parallel umpteen number ways. So here's where we're going to prototype, uh, prototype our code. Um, CD development. This is just the way I like to organize my code. Blue waters. Uh, uh, we're going to do here. And here, I'm going to make a, a, a Python uh, script that is uh, that will contain that those major steps. About uh, it, it'll have a main function, or it will have a you know if name equals main section in it. And then it will call a function that goes through and grabs all the the host names, constructs your parameter, uh, the the host name ports for uh, for the parameter server list, the host name ports for the uh, worker list, and then you know does that basically everything we just talked about. So simple progression dot py. If I misspell things, I apologize. I, I'm free coding at this point. So just a simple Python script. Here we go. So here I'm going to do my. There, that's behaving much nicer. All right. So like any any good developer, many of you probably can, uh, uh, you know, from scratch start t typing out a, a, a Python program. I'm going to cheat and recycle some of my my older work. So first. Do one of these, bam. Uh, I'm actually not going to do that. <clears throat> the function I'm going to define, the, the thing that's actually going to uh, get run here. Is this guy? So at the moment, this thing does nothing. If I'm over here in BW mom and I do, let's see, uh, oops, let's do module load BWPY. Um, I'm also going to want an BWPY MPI. AP run minus N, uh, let's just do two. Uh, let's go over here, oops. Hello. Uh, Python. Uh, what was I calling it? Simple regression. Hello. Look at that. All right. So what I did is I told it to run uh, uh, two total instances of uh, Python's uh, space simple regression. 
and I told it to uh, run one instance on each node. I could have done this. And this will just take a second. Uh, hmm. So, sorry, screwed that up. Bam, that's what I wanted to do. So this will uh, uh, print out hello four times. It happens to have uh, ran two of them on one node and two of them on the other. Great. Okay, so in our simple regression, if you remember, uh, we want to generate some, some mock data, some faux data that uh, has some properties we know about. So uh, if we're doing a linear, a linear fit that has a slope and a y-intercept, so I'm gonna create tr true slope, true y-intercept, negative three, I'm gonna make it a float. Um, so whatever model I train, I hope that its weights, its trainable parameters, when TensorFlow is done with whatever it's doing, uh, its trainable parameters, one of them is going to be 0.3 and one of them is going to be negative three. Okay, so I'm not gonna bore you with too many of these details. Um, NumPy, oops. No, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to use the uh, random module to generate data. Uh, I'm doing this for a little bit for pedagogical reasons. TensorFlow has, uh, has methods that will generate random data for you. Uh, what, what the thing I'm trying to get across here is you can suck in data from basically anywhere and do whatever you want with it. It's not necessarily the most efficient way of doing it, but for pedagogical reasons, I'm saying, all right, let's just use built-in random to generate some data. And once we have that, we'll, <coughs> oops, we'll, uh, We'll, uh, we'll turn it into uh, TensorFlow type stuff. All right, X data. <coughs> so this is, this is basically the input for your model. This isn't fancy input, this is just a single dimension, dimensional input, uh, and they are uh, just values. This list expression, um, I forget, let me get rid of X range. Uh, this will produce a, uh, produce numbers between uh, zero and 10. So this is just randomly sampling, sampling some input do domain of floats uh, between zero and 10. Um, num train. Let's do a thousand. So one thing I'll point out is that this is going to get run for uh, every t uh, for every uh, uh, processing element, which is okay. Uh, which means this is sort of a soft scaling as we do uh, more and more things in parallel. Um, as we do more and more things in parallel, uh, we just are training on more and more data. Uh, indeed, uh, it should train faster if we're lucky. Oh, uh, so number of training samples is going, I'm going to start that off with 1,000. Number of validation samples, I'm going to try, uh, start that off with 100. Uh, input domain, oops. Noise width, number of steps. Great. Oops. All right, so that's my X data. Now the linear model that I, I want to train on will have a slope of 0.3 and a true uh, uh, y-intercept of negative three. Um, so what I'm going to do, oops, is I'm first going to build some noise. Right, I mean, if I, if I have, a, have a linear model and I just want to build a line, yes, I can plug all that, the way I sampled my X domain into that, and I can get all my, my values on this line, but that's not very exciting. 
So I want to uh, build a whole bunch of stuff that moves all this business around. Uh, and that's what this is going to do. And I happen to do a, uh, a, a just a, a normal distribution on this. So this looks like a bell curve. Centered at zero, noise width of 0.1. So one, uh, one, one uh, sigma, uh, 0.1 sigma. So you expect most of the values to be around uh, somewhere between negative 0.1 and 0.1. Uh, what, what is that? Something like 50% of the values, 30, 30%. I forget exactly what that was. All right, apply data. Okay. So here is where I'm actually building this this mock data, this this uh, the, uh, this thing that I want to uh, play around with. So I take all those weights that I did above. Oops. Make sure I didn't do that right. So I take. Uh, um, I take all my, let's see, oh, that's what I, what I did here. So I went ahead and zipped, uh, zipped my X data together with my noise. I take the, the, the way I'm sampling my X domain and I multiply it by the slope. This is just MX plus B, X, M plus B, plus the noise. Cool. If I weren't talking so much and uh, and all that, this is something you could do two minutes. Um, so if you if you want to do just sanity checks to see if something's working right, there you go. Generate some data. Um, so I'm going to slice this up into my training set and my validation set. All right. So all of that uh, wasn't. Uh, all of that is what it is. Um, this has uh, up to here has nothing to do with data science, or I'm sorry, it has nothing to do with uh, TensorFlow. It's just basic data science. This is the the uh, zeroth degree problem that we can do with data science. It's just, uh, and, and that uh, that is basically train, uh, building all these blue dots through here. All right, now let's get into some uh, TensorFlow business. <clears throat> um, I'm going to start uh, building some pieces. Uh, at this point, I might have this out of order a little bit. Uh, this thing here is indeed uh, creating a step counter. Uh, this thing here, in terms of raw data, is simply uh, an integer. Uh, at least that's what it was the last time I dug through the code. There might be uh, 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 more more uh, fancy frills added on here um, for uh, mutexes or, 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 or semifors or whatever they're using underneath the hood to synchronize this. But effectively, this thing is just an integer. Oh, we're right. Copying this out of an old example a little bit so it's cleaner. And also, there's some pedagogy in watching me go through each of these and isolating everything. OK, up above, we use just built in functions to generate some faux mock data. This is the step that actually creates uh, a, a, a tensor, a constant tensor at that. Um, and it's the input data for that. Uh, there's things called, uh, you, can, you could have done this with variables, you could have done this with. Uh, uh, with uh, by feeding feeding uh, by feeds feeding um, you could have also done this with queues uh, I'm not uh, so I worked a lot with the queues I don't have a good lecture built for it yet um, we might talk about that a little bit at the very very end uh, time permitting but this is the simplest way that we can simply build data for a model just build a, a, a list a regular old Python list and tell it to be a TensorFlow constant of float 32s. All right. Um, all right. This line here. Uh, 
Uh, since we're doing such a simple example, uh, it's, it's a little bit lackluster, but this is the money shot. This is the thing here that is the actual model. This is the thing that contains what we're trying to work with, that contains the, uh, the, uh, uh, the slope and the, uh, uh, that contains the slope and the y-intercept. One thing I've been naughty about so far is I haven't been importing TensorFlow very well. Or TensorFlow. Um, at the moment, uh, the version of TensorFlow we have, we have to, uh, we, we, we have to import something a little bit special to get a basic dense model, uh, this uh, TensorFlow Python layers core. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a minor culture shift uh, going on with the TensorFlow code. Now that we're up to 1.7, I have no idea who's won that, that battle. But some of the original code was, uh, was written more with a, 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 a functional programming, uh, programming model and now they're building it uh, out to be a little more object oriented. And so to get the actual object that is your dense model, you have to go through tensorflow.python.layers.core uh, for the version that we are using on Blue Waters. Okay. So what is this thing? A little bit of Google won't help, won't help with. Uh, TensorFlow dense model. If I've spelled it wrong, it'll correct me. Layers dense. This is the thing I just built for us. So what uh, what is this? Let me make this bigger so you guys can see it. Uh, this is the functional interface. Ooh, how do I? Oh, uh, 1.7. This is the first thing. Let's see, can I get? Okay, to TF layers, TF layers. Okay. Uh, uh, so a uh, functional interface uh, for the densely connected layer. All right. Um, so I put this slide back up here so that I can reference it later. If we had a single input, a single output, and a um, uh, a single hidden layer, that's roughly a line, especially if we use a linear activation function. Uh, this layer uh, implements the upper, uh, uh, a functional interface for densely connected layers. The way I drew this, this is densely connected. And so I'm going to use that and use one, one, and one to do a linear model. So the activation uh, by default, let's see, activation, activity regulated by uh, kernel uh, activation. Somewhere down here it says if activation is none, activation function, you can pass it whatever one of these you want. You can go to find your own. <clears throat> if it's none, just a simple linear activation. So this is just an MX plus B. And so there's a whole bunch of other things going on. If you, um, uh, let's see, activity uh, regularization, you can go regularize all the, the weights on it. Uh, bias regularization, you go uh, regular, regularize all the bias weight uh, uh, trainable parameters on it and, and the kernel, you know, all the kernels that go in there and whatnot. So this thing has a lot of features, but we're only using the fact that it has a linear activation. Great. All right, so that's our inference, that's our model. Save, save off, didn't stupid, there you go. All right, so once we have our model, we need to compute loss, and, uh, uh, and then we need to optimize. So training loss. Oh, 
Okay, so um, TensorFlow defines a whole bunch of uh, loss function. Well, de defines the two two main loss functions for you: uh, mean squared and uh, 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 cross entropy. Uh, this example, I'm just going to use a regular mean squared uh, uh, loss function. So let's see. Heuristically, um, we need to pass in. So uh, let's see. Oh, I haven't done that portion yet. So I have. So I created an object called linear model. I still need to tell it uh, what data it actually needs to operate on. And that's that data that I defined earlier, TFX train data. Did I do split in here? Oh, good, I did it there. I program in a very nonlinear fashion. I go get the big items and then go fill in all the littler stuff. So this, the thing that linear model returns is, you know, whenever I initialize this uh, this dense dense model up here, it picked, presumably, it picked some random m and some random b. Uh, if we go back here, uh, pretty sure you can uh, use bias. Right, you, if you wanted some different, oh, wait, no, no, uh, where is it? Trainable, reuse, uh, I forget exactly. Kernel initializer. So you could, let's see, if none, what does it do? If none, weights are initialized using default initializer used by get variable. Presumably it's random. All right, so this dense layer at this moment, this is your model, and it has who knows what M and B inside of it. And when you pass the data through it, it's going to give you wild and crazy values here, probably nothing like what the actual data is. The loss says, all right, you pass it the labels. In our case, the labels are the, the uh, the true Y data we grabbed, or that we generated earlier, and it's going to compare it against the with whatever uh, whatever the weights are initially. It's going to go compare it against uh, the predictions, and it's going to do it's going to take the difference, take the square, sum it all up, take the uh, square root of that, and dump it into a single value, the loss. Optimizer. So with so up, up to this point, we told TensorFlow what the model is, and then we told TensorFlow, once you use that model, how do you uh, decide whether it's a good one or a bad one? Now we're going to tell TensorFlow that if it is indeed a bad one, how do you change the current, whoops, uh, oh, darn. Uh, if it is indeed a bad one, how do you change the, the, the weights of your model uh, to something better. Um, and we're going to use gradient descent. Uh, this will be, a, a, a TensorFlow has plenty of others. This Autograd, months ago I read this paper, it's really neat, uh, it's a wave of the future, go use it. There are problems with it too, but uh, um, you know, d don't be timid about the different uh, optimizers. Gradient descent is just the, you know, if you, uh, if you remember your Calc 3, uh, class. That's basically what it's doing. And then you have to tell it what exactly we're optimizing. We're optimizing the loss. We're trying to minimize the loss. It takes in a global step to know, uh, <coughs> um, uh, to basically uh, know uh, where it's at. Uh, to, oh, uh, no, it takes it into increment it. This is uh, this optimized step is the thing that actually kicks everything off. This is the one that says, "Oh, if you've gotten here, indeed, you have performed one entire step." Session. 
All right, so because I was super excited, he skipped over a whole bunch of stuff. I'm gonna go back and explain to you. All right, so here's the monitored session. This is the thing that uh, says, oh, you defined all these operations that you want to do. You have your, your input data, you have uh, your validation or your, your, your training data, you, you have your model and the way you compute loss and the way you optimize your model. So you have all these things that you went and defined in the gra graph up above. This monitor training session is the thing that says, great, I, I'll, go, I'll go do all that for you. So while not, so it looks at the monitored uh, training session and it asks it, uh, am I done? Have I done everything you've told me? Uh, that that uh, have, I, have I done everything that I should? So basically I'm setting up a, a big long loop. That iterates through uh, the way we describe this model. Uh, forward, back, forward propagation, backward propagation, uh, uh, Oh, yeah, that's right, good. Computer loss, uh, optimize your weights, and so forth. Okay, so when you call run here, the thing I'm actually running is the train and then loss. So over and over and over again, as this while loop uh, ticks away, you're gonna say, uh, it's going to say, oh, uh, go compute some gradients and evolve the weights in this direction, go recompute all the loss and do it all over again. And every one of those steps, it indeed returns whatever uh, the output tensor of the training is, uh, which is some uh, big, uh, big, uh, big, uh, big tensor. At the moment, my, my memory is a little uh, fuzzy, so I'm not going to try and describe exactly what this thing is. But if we were to indeed print it out, it would be a little bit, it would be hard to read right off the bat. And whatever the, that loss value happened to be. So when this monitor session dot run executes, indeed it is in fact going to compute uh, whatever the loss of your model is at whatever step this is. And I went ahead and printed all that out. So we can see something. So if I had students in front of me, um, and if I were doing this in front of a, a class where there's a lot more feedback, uh, presumably uh, people would have started yelling at me about, oh, where's all the distributed stuff? Let's go back and fill all that in. So, so far I basically went through and did an example about just vanilla TensorFlow, how do you build a model? How do you build a model that does something useful, <laughs> marginally useful? Um, and these are the, the major components of that. Now I'm going to go back and start peppering in all the uh, all the uh, distributed uh, the specific distributed TensorFlow details. So if you remember what those were, those are go figure out who your oh gather look at this oh that's why I was confused I changed this up a little oh no no no. change this up a little bit. So let's go at uh, pepper all that in. So setting up the the, the light uh, piece of MPI I need to. For some reason I didn't grab that. So here, uh, setting up my uh, com world, um, this uh, socket, import socket, uh, get host name, this is just a string, uh, it'll be NID something, 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 some numbers, I do my all gather on that. Super simple test. Uh, 
Oh, that's how I did it. All right, so we walked through this bit of code once already. Let's go grab it. Bam. Let's see. Oops. This probably isn't. Oh, he, I also used from iter tools. Goodbye. Oops. Uh, if you guys don't know about iter tools, I highly suggest uh, uh, learning more about it. Um, it's super nice. That's all I got. So we got all our host names. Um, I get all the, the unique host names. Uh, <coughs> just the keys there. Run through that. Let's make sure I do everything I need to. Um, I took just two of the ranks out, off of here. So if I Oops, I don't want to do that. So if I happen to do something silly, like, uh, what did I do this at? Uh, let's do, well, if I happen to do something silly, like, uh, like that, and I, I gave it more processing elements per node. This will print out six hellos. This bit of code, th that bit of code there, uh, filters out all the extraneous things. It only keeps the two that we want. All right, so a little bit of logic about do nothing. Sorry, the uh, patch of code I was working off of, I've changed since I went this far into it. Just this guy. We don't keep this here because I'm going to do something else. Great. Uh, host ranks, PS ranks, get all this right. Most of that code shouldn't happen. I'm waiting. All right. Um, Go ahead and print all this out for you so we can see it. And then cluster spec. There we go. All of that was just necessarily Sari evil uh, to get this guy here. Bam, 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 bam. So I set up the server, set up the cl uh, cluster spec, I set up the server. Um, TF index, I get my index correct. Uh, I think I imported everything I need. Cluster, put some barriers in there. 
and I'll show you that in a second. Train, cool. Let's go back here. Main. Test. That's what I was looking for. So I can remember. Noise. This is all the data we talked about. Train split. Okay. The other thing specific uh, <coughs> to distributed TensorFlow is indeed these, uh, <coughs> let's see, where is it? Um, where we built this data, these constants. So pedagogically, this might not have been, let's see, search constant. This might not have been the best thing to use, but these things are getting shared on the parameter server. So everybody sees roughly the same list. So if you're iterating through this list uh, and you have uh, six and, and you have, uh, let's say, four different workers iterating through it, one will start at the top. The next one will then try and grab it too and say, oh, the other guy was already at the top. The parameter server will communicate this to him. They'll say, oh, the other one's already at the top. I guess I'll take the next one. And then the next one after that will take it and the next one after that will take it. My point is this is shared. Uh, for pedagogical reasons, I'm going to split it up so that, fine, there is a global copy but the iterator, uh, the iterator that's walking through the, uh, the list won't, uh, I, I want kind of a, a each, each worker to have its own knowledge of where it is uh, while it's walking through the training data. So I'm going to use TF split. And <clears throat> so I'm going to use TF split to chop it up into however many workers we decided to have. And then I'm going to look at the, and I'm gonna look at myself and say, oh, I'm the ith worker, so this TF index. Let me talk about that a little more, TF index. I forgot to tell you about that. So when a distributed uh, TensorFlow uh, cluster gets started, I've talked a lot about um, I've talked a lot about that it's, there's parameter servers and, and, and workers and all that kind of thing, but one thing I kind of just uh, glossed over, oops, where is it? If there's a collection of parameter servers and if there's a collection of workers, uh, indeed, they get indexed. So parameter servers has their own indexing space, workers has their own indexing space. So in addition to deciding who gets which host names, you also have to decide uh, who's the zeroth, who's the first, who's the second, and so forth. And that's what this piece of code here does. Cool. Um, Dense model, optimizer. All right, I'm getting close. We're not gonna do validation quite yet. All right, so here's another uh, small detail. Yet another one. Uh, hooks. <clears throat> so while, while this monitor tra training session is happening, um, sometimes you want to execute, uh, you know, some special maintenance type things. Um, in particular, sometimes you want to look at your step and say, oh, I'm done. Let's abort. Let's get out of this. That's what the stop at step hook does. So this is the thing that is globally shared that's looking at, at the global step and as everybody simultaneously is stepping through their data and training their model and uh, whatnot, uh, it's reporting back to the monitored training session 
Um, and this thing here is the thing that says, oh, when, when that global step number gets to whatever num steps is, be done. Or rather, down here, this monitored session should stop, return false. So I need to move that over. Um, let's see. Did I put that in here yet? Yes, I did. Hooks. Look at that. Um, there's also a final op hook. Uh, I uh, will, if we have time today, I'll talk a little bit about this. If you want to add printing tensors that simply print the internals of your model uh, before the thing exits, I find that's useful for debugging. Um, instead of trying to sort through whatever your dot run returns. So there's that. Let's see, I think I I'm train. Let's do 100 to get started. Directory dot slash numps. Uh, keep talking back and forth about this. So right now I'm just cleaning up my example. I already kind of worked myself into a corner. I'll back up out of that in a second. I'm going to come back and modify that in a second. Uh, in fact, I'm going to try and run it here in a moment, just so you guys stop being so bored. Do nothing. So we set up the cluster. I want to make sure I got all my major stuff. Whoops. TF index, do I need to get with that yet? No, I don't. OK, that's fine. I set up the actual uh, model portion of it, the, the raw. Oh, that's one thing I didn't do. All right, since I changed things around, whoops, yeah, let's fix all this up. So I have X data local um, and Y data local. If you remember in the model, uh, I gave it TFX train. If I let it run like this at the moment, uh, I would have that, uh, that iterator problem. Uh, each of the workers would be trying to walk through that list and uh, advancing the iterator, and uh, they wouldn't know that they were supposed to stop. Steps, global step, cool. Run, loss. I've probably made some mistakes, but this is the, 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 the broad brushstroke of what you have to do to do a simple distributed uh, TensorFlow. All right. Oops, I want that back. I want this guy. What's going to happen? Oh, hey, look, it already yelled at me there.
this is going to break. And I'm going to tell you why in a second. Missing parentheses, okay. Um, that's line 54. Oh, this was the thing I said. Uh, they've recently changed the BWPY business. So I need to back out of this. Sorry, these were changes that were made pretty recently and I haven't gone and cleaned this up yet. Yeah. All right, so did I do any more weird prints? My rank is that. Percentage, 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 run on worker. Cool, that one's already there. Bam. All right, let's try it again. Um, so after you know, after we get through all these details, there there is a, a only medium barrier to entry uh, to to set one of these jobs up. Oh. Um, I know what I'm gonna do. Unload BWPY. Zero dot three dot two. I know this one works uh, for my for my code. And then there. Uh, so to fix that, zip is uh, in Python three. Zip is no longer iterable or subscriptable. I'm sorry. It uh, it produces a, uh, either a, gen a generator or an iterator. I think it returns a gen uh, an iterator. So to do a slicing like that, thank you. So to do slicing like that, you need to uh, I use iter tools. doing something. The reason I chose this example is that this is the thing that took less than one value to unpack. Okay, so the mistake I made was I was mixing my uh, parameter server schemes. Um, I want to do the simple one for you guys, so let me go back and fix that. But I copied the code for the more complicated one. Um, so this guy, so let's go through this. Usable ranks. Um, so that basically, let's see. So that basically gives me all, uh, all the ranks that are on unique hosts. And what I want to do is PS ranks. Uh, usable ranks. PS ranks, I want the first num PS. 
somebody knows a more Pythonic way of doing this. And for the worker ranks, I want to give it everything else after that. And so, let's see. Yeah, that's what I want to do there. So what this will do is indeed I get all the right ranks. Uh, the parameter servers here are the PS ranks. The first umpteen of them correspond to the first umpteen of the unique host names. The last umpteen of them correspond uh, for the workers uh, correspond to the last umpteen uh, unique host names. I'm going to break this down to one. Oh, that should work. Get rid of that. Nice. Oops. So we have 10 minutes. I'm trying to show you guys that the loss goes down. That's, that's the punchline here. This is, what was it up above, this TF? What was that on? That's on line 67. 67, look at that. All right. Job name, why? Job name, job name. Else if. All right, I might need to bail on this piece. confused over here. All right, I've mixed and matched a whole bunch of code that I shouldn't have. doesn't work. I might just have to apologize. Um, so this is an example of how this gets a little bit tricky too. 
Uh, you start thinking about all these schemes about where you want to put your parameter servers and workers. Um, I want to show you the simplest thing. And the simplest thing is I go get all my, um, I get, go get all my host names. And <clears throat> the, first, uh, the first, say, one of them goes to the parameter server. That's what this thing does. And the last bit of them goes to the worker. That's what that thing does. So building the uh, a parameter server host, the first host names, the first goes to the uh, first one of them goes to the parameter server. And then, whoops, I already screwed that up. Thought I fixed that correctly. Or, no, 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 I did that right. Good, good. I just saw it wrong. And the last goes to the worker. Shoot in the dark here a little bit. Get rid of all this do nothing stuff. Uh, this might screw me. what it is. Sorry, when I rehearsed this, I was able to find the blocks of code I wanted to cut all the examples out of. And, uh, you guys didn't notice it earlier, but I got mixed up which blocks of code I was in. Oh. So I mix, uh, mixed up some of the details. Oh, pff. this doesn't make sense. So now I think we're getting close. Uh, so one thing I might try to do the thing I'm trying to show you. So to, All right, so this thing's still wired up for that. Let me see if I can get away with that. Uh, 
so if you guys notice, I have this uh, file called main that I've been taking examples of. This was my sanity check that uh, I used during uh, debugging. It had a lot of, a lot of weird, some weird things in it. Um, and at some point when I was bouncing through here, I mixed up uh, where I was pulling code from and bringing it over here. So what I'm doing now is I'm kind of bailing out and seeing if my main.py still indeed works. And it doesn't. <laughs> so let's see, I am at time. Uh, unfortunately, the, the demo god was not with me. What I'm trying to get at uh, with this big long example is indeed there's the section where you have to go sort out all of your uh, your host names, give some of the host names to your parameter servers, some of them to your workers. Uh, you need to uh, index them correctly. You need to build your cluster and your server. Uh, so that's that's the initial initialization portion of distributed TensorFlow. After that, this example was all right. Let's just build a simple uh, simple cloud of data, like a linear, like that guy, and let's build a simple uh, linear model. That is what dense. That's what that piece was. Um, you also have to split up your data so that each worker knows which uh, batch it, uh, it wants to work on. And then construct your, uh, construct your stop hook and your monitored training sessions session. Recall that you're passing the server target, the thing that you, you've built um, with all the host names to it. It's the thing that is telling that whenever you run session.run train comma loss, it's the thing that knows uh, where to push and pull the weights and the parameters. This monitor session.run loss will return a big complicated tensor and then maybe not that complicated and then how much loss that step of the training actually computed. And this would have printed that indeed at each step the loss goes down. Um, and you could have looked at your linear model. Could have looked at the kernel in your linear model to see that the kernel was indeed getting closer to getting closer to true M and true B. Um, honestly, I don't know why this guy, my main.py, isn't working. That was working recently. Um, but I think, uh, so I don't bore you guys too much more, that's kind of where I want to stop on that uh, little disappointing uh, detail going on. Um, so at the end of the day, This inception distributed train is basically the version of what I just showed you, but doing the full inception model. So there's a loss in here, there's the inference, and there's the optimize. And this one is working. Uh, it just takes longer to load and to, to watch it do, do the right thing. So with that said, I think I'm going to con uh, conclude. And if there's any questions, uh, sorry for the, the disappointment there with the, some dumb mistake. But uh, that's it. That's what I got. OK, well, thank you, Aaron. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and post them to the YouTube chat or to Slack. Um, but perhaps I might ask Aaron if you're going to resolve the problem. Maybe we could email people the final solution. We could. We could. That might be a good way to if people get them it. the final working version. Or post it. Uh, do you, uh, could you post it on the uh, the webinar page? Sure, we will do that too. Cool. So we'll we'll get the the final 
resolved working version posted so you all have access to that. I don't see any more questions, so join me in thanking Aaron for a very in-depth and useful uh, presentation on uh, TensorFlow. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, coming up, our next uh, webinar will be April 18th. Uh, a different topic than some of our others. This will focus on the Exceed Service Provider Forum and will be presented by Dan Stanzione, the director of the TAC Center. So we look forward to seeing you on the 18th. With that, uh, let us know of any comments and suggestions you have, and we look forward to seeing you in a future webinar. Thank you.